Hello and welcome to another episode of the Daily Remedy Podcast. Today we're here with Dr. Art Lazarus, author of Medicine on Fire, a narrative travelogue. And here's the cover of the book here. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lazarus. Hey, Jay. Thank you for having me. appreciate being on your podcast. Of course. Uh, before we begin and discuss your book, can you talk a little bit about your own background and your own journey as a physician? Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, I'm a psychiatrist by training, and um, I was trained at Temple University Medical School in Philadelphia. I uh, went to medical school there, stayed on for my residency, stayed on for faculty, and had an academic career for a number of years. I gradually shifted, uh, my interest shifted more towards population health, what we now call population health. Back in those days, it was almost synonymous with managed care. Uh, before that became a dirty word, <laughs> and uh, and as my focus shifted from one-on-one -on -one care to um, uh, population health care, I um, I did gravitate away from practice and into the uh, health insurance industry, and uh, I had a good run there. Um, and then finally, uh, at the latter end of my career, I decided to go into the pharmaceutical industry um, and I had a long time desire uh, to work in that industry. Always um, uh, interested in, in the way drugs work and particularly psychiatric medications and uh, very interested in clinical development. Uh, but also interested at the other end of the spectrum, which is to say the, the commercial end of the spectrum. Um, so. I, I not only was involved in clinical trials, but also reviewing advertising and promotion, um, direct-to-consumer advertising for medical accuracy and so forth. Um, and then finally, um, around the time that COVID struck, um, I thought I would retire. And um, I had a lot of stories, you know, that I had uh, wanted to write about. Uh, that uh, time, you know, full-time practice uh, or, or position actually in industry just didn't afford me to write, the time to write. So uh, when COVID uh, came, uh, I started writing, um, but I felt that retirement really wasn't uh, well-suited uh, for me. So I, I, I went back into uh, a full-time position where I currently work for a health insurance company here in North Carolina. Um, and I just find the time to write, uh, usually uh, an hour every morning. Um, and um, with that in mind, you know, uh, Medicine on Fire became my second book of, of essays. My style of writing, Jay, is is short uh, five to six minute read essays. Um, sometimes uh, they're viewpoints or op-eds. Um, other times they are recounting some stories in my career. Um, and what I've done is been able to uh, collect these stories and put them into a book volume. Uh, the first one was published last year. It was called Every Story Counts, um, Examining Contemporary Practice uh, Through Narrative Medicine. Uh, and I continue to write, and um, hence the second book, uh, Medicine on Fire. And I still have a lot more stories in me for one or two more books. Mm -hmm. Let's go into a few of the stories because I think it's important for the audience to understand how it's written. I'm going to select the one that I found to be the most compelling. And this was <clears throat> Chapter 8, again, Exploring the Connection Between Creativity and Narrative Medicine Writing. And this was written as almost a letter to somebody named Vincent. And at the end, you quote a poem. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose to publish this letter and just the writing style itself, kind of ending with a, a verse, a poetic verse, and having this addressed in such a personal manner? Interesting that you should pick that one. Uh, that Let me also preface this by saying that um, becoming interested in, in, in narrative medicine I decided to enroll in a, in a, in a graduate level course uh, at a local university here in North Carolina, although the course is given virtually, but it, it is part of a narrative uh, medicine program uh, at Lenore Ryan University. 
Um, and they do have a graduate degree for those who are interested in a master's of fine arts degree in creative writing. I'm not interested in going, going the distance, quite frankly, but I've, um, I've been taking courses there. And that particular essay that you just mentioned was something that I wrote for that narrative medicine um, course. And um, other other essays of mine, um, you know, were written outside of the classroom. Um, many of them were published online at popular websites, not only yours uh, recently, but also Kevin MD, for example, um, Doximity, MedPage Today. Um, but I'm I'm trying to um, I have the book in front of me. Which essay was it, uh, Jay? It was eight, the chapter eight, began Dear Vincent. So let eight. me read the title one more time. Right. So I'll, so it's exploring the connection between creativity and narrative medicine writing. Mm -hmm. So exactly. <clears throat> there is a lot of talk about. Well, first of all, narrative medicine doesn't and creative medicine writing aren't necessarily one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of creativity that goes into writing and there's a lot of writers who are creative, but not, you know, all writing needs to be in a creative vein. The stories between patients and doctors don't necessarily have to be creative, but they have to be authentic, they have to be true, and they have to be real. Um, but I was, at, this, at the time that I wrote this essay, I was very interested in the connection between creativity and narrative medicine writing. Mm -hmm. And so it starts off with Dear Vincent as a salutation. I wanted to write something a little bit different and a little bit in a creative vein. Um, I'll be the first one to tell you or anyone, you know, I'm not the most creative person around. It hasn't stopped me from writing, but um, I don't consider myself particularly creative. Once in a while, you know, uh, there will be a spark. Um, but uh, I was, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I was trained more in, in the academic vein, and, and my writing prior to writing in a narrative style was very academically oriented. A lot of my publications, most of them, you know, were, were academic and published in academic journals. And then, of course, you know, when I was in the pharmaceutical industry, and that I didn't mention it, but I, I worked in pharma for 12 years, um, it's, it's a very rigid, formal, you know, academic way of writing. One of the chapters in here actually discusses that and, and how to undo what we learn in academia to write in a narrative fashion. So uh, I tried to, uh, we were talking about creativity in class and um, there, there were about 15 people in the classroom, again, all joining virtually one evening a week for two hours. About a third of the class were doctors. Um, and... Um, I think what happened here is a lot of times I just start out writing literally like a painter with a, a blank canvas. Uh, I don't exactly know where I'm I'm going. I just start writing. Things just may start to come out. I have something on my mind that I've read, um, you know, that I wanted to write about, an opinion, something that I may have been thinking about in the shower, something uh, during daydreaming. Um, and... And it's often helpful uh, to start writing um, without really knowing where the end will be. And that's that's what this um, narrative was, was discussing. And um, Dear Vincent turned out to be Vincent Van Gogh, obviously. Yeah. And I was thinking about create not only creative writers, but, you know, creative painters. Yeah. And and who, in my, to my estimation, who more creative than, than Vincent. So... In here, I made a comparison between how writers and painters can both be creative. You know, we, we paint or we write with a blank canvas metaphorically. Um, and then uh, I think in the, you know, um, I ended it with a cup. I love music. Um, yeah. You know, I was basically uh, grew up in the, in the in the late 60s, early 70s with rock and roll music. Uh, first, the British invasion when I was in grade school, and then later on, uh, American artists came to the scene with rock music. And uh, um, I think, in a way, um, music, especially the lyrics, are a form of narrative. Um, and I've done um, 
a deep dive into some lyrics and made the comparison how music can be as healing as writing can be. And when you look at the lyrics, especially in relation to medicine, there are certain themes um, where doctors, you know, are, are used for, you know, um, to prescribe medications for, for uh, forlorn lovers and love sickness. And, and often doctors are mentioned that way in songs. Um, but I was thinking about Vincent and Vincent van Gogh. And so I ended this with a couple of lyrics um, from two different songs. Uh, one by um, um, Michael Franks. Michael Franks, mm -hmm. not particularly well known, but someone I followed for a long time um, who um, has some great, great jazz session musicians uh, uh, playing with him on his, his albums. And he has very, very interesting lyrics to his songs, very listenable. And so he wrote a song uh, called The Yellow House, which was um, toward Vincent's uh, end of his career, that he shared a, a yellow house with um, Paul Gauguin in, in the south of France. The time in the yellow house and the relationship with Gauguin only lasted a, a few months. From what I understand, Vincent was... Um, delving into a psychotic episode at the time it was, it was a very tumultuous period in relationship um but so i included some lyrics uh from the yellow house um um uh and um there was a line in there where um um where uh frank says that although uh, uh he painted sunflowers his relationship to paul was akin to a brother. Uh, regrettably, um, um, the relationship that the two men shared was not enough to distract you in the end, to distract Vincent in the end. As, uh, you know, as we know, he um, 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 died penniless um, um, from self-inflicted uh, wounds. And um, um, there was also a song by Don McLean, which is very, very famous, still played on the radio today. Um, um, and uh, the, the lyric in there is, uh, you took your life as lovers often do. But I could have told you, Vincent, the world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. So, hmm. so you know, I, it was the whole interplay between uh, writing and um and music and creativity and bipolar disorder a lot of folks with uh bipolar disorder you know have been labeled creative um a lot of people with mental illness in general have been labeled creative but not everyone obviously who's mentally ill shows creative traits books have been written on this topic and and uh will probably continue to be written um i don't know where the seed of creativity is I know some people have it more than others. Um, I struggle to find it, you know, and I think partly because it's been suppressed throughout my career through through uh, through leaning towards an academic style of writing. Mm -hmm. On that note, kind of turning towards the academic style of writing, there's another chapter in here that I want to uh, raise awareness of in contrast to the previous chapter, and that's chapter 15. It's titled, Medical School Applicants Do Not Need to quote unquote, check a box to succeed. And it's a very instructive, I would say, almost optimistic read that one critiques the Supreme Court ruling. So there's a bit of a, a political um, element to it, but it's very instructive in a very optimistic manner for pre-med students who are looking to get into medical school. Well, why include that chapter in the book? Uh, it was it was meant to be an empowering essay. Um, as you know, the Supreme Court basically uh, overturned affirmative action admissions. And now we're going even further where. Uh, well, let me just say at the outset for your audience, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a liberal, you know, and um, and I really don't like what I'm seeing. Uh, where there's an infiltrated infiltration of conservative politicians in top-notch universities. Uh, there's basically an infiltration of governments in certain states that are basically doing away with diversity, equity, and inclusiveness criteria, DEI, 
um, that goes by the moniker <clears throat> DEI, um, trying to eliminate the teaching of diversity um, in, in the public school system and, and public schools of higher education. University of Florida, for example, very recently just had to fire um, all their DEI staff, get rid of all of their DEI programs. Um, uh, they hired a very conservative uh, former Republican um, individual to become the president of the University of Florida. Um, so this all emanates from Ron DeSantis, just call it for what it is, you know, in his conservative style of, of governing. Um, and I, I just don't agree with it personally. So as I said, some of my essays, really, they're not stories at all. They're, they're, they're sharp viewpoints or op-eds. And mm -hmm. this was one of them where a after uh, the Supreme Court uh, overturned affirmative actions, um, I, I basically, you know, said to myself that really good, strong candidates for medical school may not need um, affirmative action policies to be admitted. Um, uh, and that uh, there are still other ways, which I discuss in the following essay in this book, of to diversify the student body in medical schools, you know, without having affirmative action policies yeah, um, that is, uh, and, chapter and 16 how to legally diversify 16. the healthcare workforce exactly that flowed right out of the, the you know the one that you had um just brought up uh, about medical students don't need to check a box the box obviously i'm referring to is you know what is your race what is your nationality mm -hmm. and so forth that's not legal anymore to ask those questions um and i think that strong students can still stand out without quote unquote checking a box. Um, and um, for example, at my own medical school at Temple, uh, one of the innovative things that they've done was they have um, community representatives on their admissions committees and they do have a vote. Um, so, um, you know, there's another controversy about whether, you know, um, my doctor should look like me. Um, should 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 there always be uh, an ethnic, you know, and class and demographic match between a physician and and the patient? I don't think that's necessary. I think that the chemistry goes beyond that. It may help in some instances, but it, it's not an end all be all. Um, and I think that having people in the community serve on admissions committees helps to some extent, but I think we also have to guard against just overt bias in the other direction uh, where, where, where uh, uh, excellent candidates are ruled out um, because they're not seen as minority candidates or a certain ethnicity. So it does cut both ways. And and uh, and I think that's where what I was trying to do here with this essay is really, um, at the on the at the one hand, lament the fact that uh, ad, uh, affirmative actions was eliminated, but on the other hand, say it may not be necessary to still um, um, choose strong candidates and, and diversify medical school classes. Yeah, there's also um, some topical writing as well. Uh, on chapter uh, 23, uh, there's a uh, about the Will Smith meltdown, as you say, learning from the Will Smith meltdown. And the title is Reading Our Patient's Facial Expressions. Why did you choose to write such a kind of pop culture topical uh, essay, but then correlate it to something that uh, is very important, emotional awareness? I, as a psychiatrist especially, I'm always interested in nonverbal behavior. Um, it, it's very important to pay, that we pay attention to it, you know, as physicians, obviously. Um, and unfortunately, with the electronic medical records, it's, it's more in the way they're positioned, as, as has been written about, you know, extensively, it's difficult to make eye contact and um, you're paying more attention to the computer screen and typing than you are to your patient. So, so it was, it was with that in mind um, that I was thinking about the whole Will Smith incident at the Academy Awards a couple years ago. 
he apologized feebly afterwards for what it's worth. And I say for what it's worth because if you look at his facial expression at the time that he he made that infamous slap of Chris, Chris Rock, um, his facial expression said it all. It was almost like a, a childish pride. Like he, he was, you know, defending his wife and the insult, you know, the, that he perceived was an insult against her. Um, and I think, you know, deep down he 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 was happy that he, 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 he you know, he resorted to violence. Not only was proud of himself for doing that, but saw himself in the role of the, of the defender as well, you know. And um, uh, so we can say whatever we want in terms of apologizing and so forth, but really facial expressions are, are you know, sometimes say it all, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, one of the first books that really ever turned me on to psychology when I was an undergrad at college was written by Charles Darwin. Um, and I, I'm going to probably botch the title, but it has the expression of emotion in animals and man. And, and Darwin showed in the 1800s that facial expressions really don't vary across species, at least from primates, you know, uh, from, you know, certain primates, uh, uh, especially, you know, monkeys, chimpanzees, to um, humans. We all have the same or similar facial expressions to certain strong emotions, surprise, happiness, sadness. Um, and so it's really hardwired into our brains to some extent, just like stories are said to be. Storytelling is hardwired into our brains. We've been doing it, you know, since mm -hmm. a antiquity. Um, the same is also true of our expressions, and we need to pay more attention to them in, in general. Um, and hire scribes if you have to, but get rid of the computer screens. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I want to now turn towards the end of the book, where you talk about the narrative of illness and healing. And one that really stuck out in my mind, actually there was two that stuck out in my mind, 27 and 28. 27 was interesting. Um, a season of emotions, spring trauma, and healing. And I thought that was really interesting because you talk about the Revolutionary War and you correlate that, very interesting, with poetic medicine. And I, I, I thought it was interesting how you referenced Dr. Ofri when we do harm. And you're very topical in the sense about the various aspects of poetic medicine and for, and I quote, for obvious reasons then spring endangers the range of emotions in me, often extreme. So you talk about these range of emotions, but it was interesting. You start with the historical and then you get into the topical referencing few physicians. What was the uh, thought behind uh, uh, this uh, particular essay? Because it was one of my favorite. Well, thank you. So A Season of Emotion, Spring Trauma and Healing was another one of these essays written um, in a narrative medicine writing course, um, trying to be a little bit more on the creative side uh, and trying to weave together really the expression of, of, of trauma. Um, it was in the springtime when I was a first year resident where I felt I was actually medically traumatized by a clinical event. And I've written about this extensively. Um, where a patient made a suicide attempt and and uh, I wasn't directly involved in this patient's care, but um, somehow there was some finger pointing in my direction. Um, and it really upset me, to, and that's putting it mildly. Um, and I think about this incident uh, from my residency a long time ago about a patient that I was never involved with who attempted suicide. Nevertheless, there were some um, uh, blame cast my way that he that you know he survived, but um, but there was still some blame that uh, you know was pointed in my direction, caused intense shame and guilt, and this happened around April, um, not, you know, close to this time of the year, um, forty plus years ago. Um, so every spring, I you know, it's it's an it's inevitable and variable that 
the thought of this incident kind of crosses my mind as a sort of anniversary reaction, which is quite typical uh, of individuals who have been traumatized and or who have PTSD. They think about the trauma incident and the trauma narrative um, every time of the year. Um, and also in April, um, my dad uh, was, was uh, born on April 15th and he died uh, on April 1st. Um, so it's a ver April and the springtime in general is very, uh, you know, um, it evokes very strong emotions for me. So the goal was really to to, dis to discuss that. Um, uh, Daniel Ofri, I like all of her books, um, and I brought her into this um, uh, essay as well. Um, it, you know, because she, you know, she, she, her most recent book, uh, is called, uh, when we do harm, a doctor confronts medical error. So uh, obviously, um, I was also thinking about, um, you know, uh, being traumatized, uh, uh, how many people, how many doctors in particular are traumatized by medical practice and particular errors that they may, uh, commit, um, it it ju I I just kind of let myself loose in this, and I think that's the best way to be creative. As I said, start with a blank canvas, see where it takes mm -hmm. you, and just, um, you know, be loose. Um, you have to be in a situation where you you don't feel pressured, where you have time, uh, and where it's conducive to writing. Um, and um, these other things that I bring into this essay as well about springtime. Um. The, the movie, The Field of Dreams, one of my favorites, which is a father-son movie, one of the best. Um, and I think about my relationship with my own dad, you know, who, as I said, passed away in, in April. I think about my my relationship with my own son, who um, were close, were, were close emotionally, but distanced geographically. And I think about him in baseball season, feel the dreams, you know, and that last line in the movie, you know, hey, dad, you want to have a catch, you know, it's just okay. so, so raw, so emotional. And then finally, the essay after that was, a, was actually a poem. I write very few poems. I think, cancel I me. think, yeah, cancel me. I think poet, poets are probably the most creative of all writers. Um, and I guess I don't write a lot of poems, as I said, because you know, I don't see myself as being all that creative. My my creativity comes out in other ways, I think, you know, in the way I link things together, which I did in that uh, essay that you just mentioned about spring and um, emotions, trauma and healing. Um, starting out with the Brandywine battlefield, which is uh, in the Battle of Brandywine in the Revolutionary War, which is uh, I literally lived um, outside of Philadelphia is nowhere near um, the um, the, you know, the geographic expanse that it, it once was, and a lot of it's been developed by uh, at builders, and uh, I owned a home that was literally built on the Brandywine battlefield. So anyway, um, uh, Cancel Me is, is, is one of the few poems that I've written, and I really... I, I, I really went, went for this one. I put myself in a position of feeling what it must like to be canceled you know, by the cancel culture, uh, for, for, or, or being censored, you know, as some academicians have been just for holding views that are, you know, opposite other people's views. So at the one time, as I said earlier, I, I view myself as liberal at the same time, I can see another side to that as well. Um, where I could have more conservative views and, 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 and this also has to do with ageism and and discrimination against the elderly and the younger people, um, you know, wanting to cancel me. It, I mean, it, yeah. it didn't happen. It hasn't happened. But it was like I put myself in that position. Um, and so I wrote me, a poem me, about. Can we actually read that line? It says, call me Republican, call me Democrat, register me a scientific zealot. So it's an interesting contrast. Yeah, um, the line that I like the best is, um, uh, first, do no harm, second, sound the alarm, 
I lived the noble doctor's life. What remains is sorrow and strife. My mm. practice like a towering sculpture toppled by the cancel culture. You know, so again, I put myself in the position of an aging physician, which I am, quite frankly, um, having lived a noble's doctor life. And then, you know, kind of like in the blink of an eye, it could, it could all be erased. Yeah. That hasn't happened to me. As I said, I want to stress this is more imagination than it is realism. But again, I think we should all we all try and untap that imaginative or creative side in us. You know, um, we, we're too much more, you know, one half of the brain, uh, those of us who have been through the trial and tribulations of, you know, pre-med and med school and that's the brain that's you know the academic the science side has been the side that's been um exercised much much more than the other half which is more the creative you know and the visual um oriented side thank you um Dr. Lazarus, in the remaining time that we have i want to ask you one question for the audience who may either be in the medical field or contemplating getting into the medical field how has writing whether it's narrative style or just writing in general, expressing yourself. How has that helped you as a physician? In, in several ways, Jay. It, first of all, it puts you more in touch with yourself. And I, and I think if you're more in touch with yourself, you can relate better to other people. If you're more aware of the emotions that spring within yourself, you can recognize them easier in patients. Um, I think uh, another way that writing helps is that it's a stress reliever. You know, everyone talk, talks about burned out, quite frank, being burned out. Quite frankly, you know, I think people are just too burned out to even want to do anything about burnout now or read about it. You know, I don't write about it anymore. I've written everything I, I need to write about burnout, you know, and and I'm not burned out, but I just don't see the value of writing about it. It's almost like, you know, unfortunately, we've kind of um capitulated um to the powers that be and 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 the winds of change you know within within medicine which is much more of a bottom line oriented algorithmic approach to to patient um diagnosis and treatment you know than than it is anything else these days so um there's a lot of stress involved in practicing obviously uh more physicians now are employed than they are in private practice, and it's very stressful working for organizations. I've worked for them for over twenty years, um, whether in health insurance, in pharma, and I, and in the grass is not greener on the other side. People have often asked me about how I made that transition um, um, because they're they're too burned out in practice. They're looking to leave to do something else, you know, in industry. And that's my line. That's what I tell them. The grass is not greener. It's it's just it it's different, you know. So there's stress no matter what. And so writing, I think, is a is a good stress reliever. And I think third, it 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 just it brings, you know, humanity, the human qualities back into the practice of medicine. As I said earlier, stories are, you know, uh we were born telling stories. That's how we communicated, you know, before language literally um, was fully developed, we, you know, uh, in, in, it was in, in crude forms of telling of stories. Um, and so uh, patients have stories. And and um, Rita Sharon from Columbia, who's considered the, one of the founders of the narrative medicine movement, you know, she titled her book, you know, Narrative Medis Medicine, uh, honoring our patients, and that we really should honor them. I think, um, you know, like uh, a, a good approach for for a, a medical student, you know, when they're learning how to take H and P's, would be like, you know, tell me not to say what I used to say. What brings you here today? You know, as a as a euphemism for what's your chief complaint? There's so many better lines to use that can tap into the narrative, like. Um, um, tell me a little bit about yourself um, or, you know, uh, what, what would you like me to know about you today? You know, there are other ways that will tap more into uh, a patient opening up and, uh, and, and communicating, you know, on a more humanistic level. And I think ultimately that is the power of, of narrative medicine. Um, 
the book the book that I'm writing now actually tentatively is is, is titled um, Medicine and the Power of Storytelling. So that's how strongly I believe that you know the telling of stories is is, is healing for both um, patients, physicians, families, caregivers, and, and so so forth. Thank you, Dr. Lazarus. Uh, thank you so much for your time. For those who may be listening and want to get a hold of you, what's the best way that they can reach out and connect with you? Well, just please send me an email. Uh, it's it's my name, artlazarus6 at gmail.com. And I'll include that in the uh, comment section below. Uh, Dr. Lazarus, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Always a pleasure.